Hey everyone, it's Naomi Wolf uh, with Daily Clout and I'm broadcasting here from AIER and I'm really excited and honored to be talking to Professor Jay Bhattacharya, um, who of course has been in the news as one of the signatories of the Great Barrington Declaration, which we're going to be talking about in more depth. So welcome Professor Bhattacharya. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be talking to you. So I'm going to insist on reading Professor Bhattacharya's bio. Um, he's much too modest to uh, let me do that comfortably, but I insisted. Um, Jay Bhattacharya is a professor of medicine at Stanford University. He is a research associate at the National Bureau of Economics Research, a senior fellow at the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research, and at the Stanford Freedom I'm sorry, Stanford Freeman Spogley Institute. He holds courtesy appointments as professor in economics and in health research and policy. He directs the Stanford Center on the Demography of Health and Aging. Dr. Bhattacharya's research focuses on the economics of healthcare around the world with a particular emphasis on the health and well being of vulnerable populations. Dr. Bhattacharya's peer reviewed research has been published in economics, statistics, legal, medical, public health, and health policy journals. He holds an MD and PhD in economics from Stanford University because why not? get both an MD and a PhD. So um, I insisted on reading that because uh, there are many versions of the signatories of the Great Barrington Declaration in the news. They've become you know, famous in some circles uh, beyond being already well known in their own academic circles and, and infamous in others. So um, first, can I just ask you, Dr. Bhattacharya, what did the Great Barrington Declaration say? Why is it such a flashpoint? Sure. So uh, the Great Barrington Declaration, it comes from two basic facts. One is that people who are older have a much higher risk from dying from COVID than people who are younger. And not just a little, it's like on the order of a thousand fold difference between the oldest and the youngest. That's a really important fact uh, because we know who's most vulnerable. It's people who are older. Uh, the, the, so the first plank of the Great Barrington Declaration, let's protect the vulnerable seems reasonable, right? That you, you have this very sharp age gradient. Let's take advantage of that. Let's, let's use our, our ingenuity, our resources to make sure older populations, people with some chronic diseases, don't uh, face risk from the virus if we possibly can. The other plank, uh, the, the idea is that the harms, the lockdowns themselves impose great harm on people. Lockdowns are not a natural, normal way to live. Everyone listening to this can understand this, right? It's not normal to not send our kids to school. It's not normal to uh, hold people back from work. It's not normal to not be able to look on people and hug your children. It's not normal. Uh, none of this is normal. Um, and it has great psychological and medical and other kinds of consequences. And it's also not very equal. People who are poor face much more hardship from the lockdowns than people who are rich. You know, you can stay in, uh, you can stay locked at home and, and have people deliver stuff to you if you're rich. But if you're poor, you're, or you have a, you know, you have a job as a grocery clerk, you kind of have to work, even if you're in the high vulnerable group. The second plank is let's lift the lockdowns. So those go together. You protect the vulnerable protect the elderly, do everything you possibly can. That, that may involve, you know, sort of closing down, like making nursing homes much more difficult to visit, things like that. And now it, what it involves is prioritizing the elderly for, for vaccinations. Um, and then, uh, but for, and for the rest, the lockdown harms are worse than COVID. The lockdown harms are worse than COVID. So that's the argument for lifting the, lifting the, um, lifting the lockdowns because mm -hmm. we're harming our kids, we're harming the poor with the lockdowns in ways that are almost impossible to recover from. So you, you guys drafted and signed the Great Barrington Declaration long before the uh, cascade of peer-reviewed studies have started to come in, which are now coming in, confirming that in fact, um, there's high suicidality among children, that um, people are being driven into poverty, that uh, domestic violence is on the rise. How did you know? And you know, you're, that's why I insisted on reading your bio. Your bio seems to be specifically to train you to predict um, outcomes among vulnerable populations on a grand scale with certain public health policies, right? But how did you know at that early point that, that lockdowns would be so harmful as, as the evidence is starting to mount that they are? I mean, even then there was some early evidence. In June, we knew that one in four young Americans seriously considered suicide. 
uh, I think in April, I saw a report that uh, 130 million people worldwide face risk of starvation. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I'd been following some of these child abuse numbers and they, they, they'd come down. And I was like, of course they came down because school is where child abuse is picked up. So it doesn't mean the child abuse isn't happening. It just means they're not, it's not being addressed. Uh, domestic violence, same kind of, same kind of uh, early, early things. I mean, I think anyone that studies public health understands that uh, public health is a complicated thing. It's a human thing. Pe people are connected to one another. You can't just simply isolate infection control from every other aspect of people's lives. Um, and so I think this intuition that there have to be collateral damage from these lockdowns, uh, it's just, it seemed really clear to me and, uh, and, uh, and all, obviously also the other signatories of the Great Franklin Declaration, but I think it should be clear now to anyone. Right. Um, You've said something really interesting I'd like to pick up on that I've never heard before in exactly those words, you said public health isn't just a matter of infection control. It has to do, I'm paraphrasing, but it has to do with how human beings relate to each other. Is that a fair uh, paraphrase of what you just said? Yeah, if public health should be about human flourishing, right? Giving people the tools so that their health isn't an impediment, but in fact, is it is a, is a, is a uh, it buttresses their life, makes them, makes them allow, allow them to achieve their, their, their aims and goals in wherever they are. So um, Wow. Can I just jump in? Because this is so fascinating. It, it's almost as if a human problem has been solved by people who don't work with human beings or people who, you know, don't who work with pathogens are trying to do something that's not their job and that they're not trained for by leaving out this question of what do humans need? How do humans interact? How have they interacted historically? Um, so that's fascinating because it does seem as a lay person not trained in either discipline that the 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 algebra of the COVID problem and proposed solutions is all about treating people like test tubes almost, or like isolates in a, in a, in a lab and, and expecting them to behave the way pathogens behave in a, in a Petri dish or wherever pathogens go, as opposed to looking at human societies. Like it seems like nobody with your background is actually drafting public health policy based and 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 what i'm hearing is people with your background like the former chief medical officer of canada um has written a very stern letter saying this is not part of our pandemic response ever the way you're supposed to deal with pandemics always time and history have shown with public health is keep things as normal as possible so is that correct that a human problem is people are trying to solve it in kind of an inhuman or non-human way yeah that's it's it is exactly the word you took the words out of my mouth and I, you know it's, it is is an inhuman approach what we've, we've taken, right? We've taken this, um, I mean, you know, like you can write down a mathematical model where in theory, if people behave the way your little Simalonians think you think they ought to behave, um, you know, if anyone's played the Sims, um, the, 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 uh, they're gonna, uh, the, it could work, but humans aren't like that. People ha are complicated. They need many, many things, mo much more than just infection control. They need connection to other people. They need a ability to, to uh, to you know, make a living for their family, they need um, to, to, to uh, time with one another. They need all kinds of things. And thinking about what those things are is, is should be what public health is about. It has been, as far as my experience, up until. Well, now. you're anticipating my next question. I mean, this is so completely mind blowing to to think about uh, because it is predictable on reflection that if you stop people from being able to make a living, they'll become poor. And then all of the you know, suffering and mortality and morbidity and pathology of poverty is on your plate. Whereas if all you're doing is looking at people from a kind of Petri dish point of view as a, as a pathologist or as a, an epi I mean, I don't even know that the, who, who is drafting these policies, but you know, if it's only about keeping this breath from this host, right? And so let's like scatter everyone, you know, yeah. and, and never let them interact. Um, it, that does seem like a huge blind spot in retrospect. So let me ask you this. We're so having read English literature for, you know, many years, um, I, I'm familiar with the fact that there have been plagues and pathogens. You know, my last book dealt with a section on cholera and typhoid. I mean, human beings have, have faced waves of horrible disease, fatal diseases before, and I'm old enough to remember the HIV epidemic as well. Um, when some of these debates were floated, like let's make sure that people who are HIV positive can't have intercourse with anyone, or let's you know register them in a registry. And 
you know, immediately there was a, pub, a, a public outcry, as I think there should have been. That's not humane. That you know, that means a police state. People have rights. You can't do that. So there was like very restrained public health response, closing the bathhouses, for instance, um, and and otherwise it was education. It was voluntary. And your Great Barrington Declaration is also voluntary, right? That's an important yes. point. So let me just ask you this: What in 130 years of of modern public health dealing with Western advanced democracies that face waves of disease, which is what you guys are trained to understand and know about, what is supposed to happen? I mean, not what's happened. I mean, I think that this idea that we lock down society for a full, full year uh, in, in trying to control the, the spread of the disease, that is not consistent with how we dealt with any pandemic in the last hundred years. So what's best practices, you know, based on 130 years of dealing with pandemics in open societies for what you're supposed to do when there's polio or when there's, you know, tuberculosis or, or HIV, what are you supposed to do? It's focus protection. It's not anything new. So you identify the folks who are at risk, give them tools to reduce and mitigate their risk consistent with their human rights. That's what you do. Wow. That's exactly what what I understand people were doing when tuberculosis resurfaced a few years ago, giving people who are at risk, identifying them, helping them um, with housing or with uh, supplementary income so that they had the choice to not get that sick and not infect other people, making sure they were taking their medication, pardon me, medication. Is that what you mean by focus protection, but not locking down everyone because yeah. there were some tubercular people in the I, area? Can, can I go back to HIV? HIV is a really good example of this. We, we're lessons we learned that we failed in COVID, right? In HIV, we learned we don't shame the person that has the disease. We give them support. We give them care. We give them love. Uh, we don't, uh, we don't like, uh, we don't make them feel guilty. Um, we, we, uh, we, in, in HIV, we, we la had this idea of harm reduction, hmm. right? Uh, you know, this, the, telling people to do inhumane things will never work because it's inhumane, right? Instead, you get, give them tools. Uh, I think that those kinds of ideas are really important uh, lessons that we learn from HIV epidemic because somehow I think we've unlearned in the kind of case of COVID. In right. COVID, we shame people that get COVID or what, what did you do wrong? Uh, what you know, we uh, we look around for someone to blame whenever some, you know th th this goes wrong. We mm -hmm. we uh, uh, we we look at uh, whole populations to blame them. Oh, your your numbers going up. Well, that means you weren't uh, you weren't following our guidelines sharply enough. All of these violate basic principles of public health, um, right. which uh, is, has been shocking to me. Like we basically threw out a, a, a generation of knowledge that we had been worked so hard to build up about how to deal with something like this. And we threw it out the window. So interesting. Another question I have is about, and it relates to what you're saying about the moralization of COVID and COVID infection, um, so heavily moralized and, and everything going along with it, you know, like mask wearing and distancing and so on. Like I'm not opining as I'm not an epidemiologist about whether those are effective or not, but as a cultural critic, I'm really aware that they are heavily weighted with more moral valence and a kind of a moral panic is among us. So here's the thing. I've been reading the peer reviewed studies um, on which a lot of news uh, presentation is purportedly based. And I'm really struck, and I'm sure I'm not saying anything you, you don't think about all the time, that the news version of what's in the study is so far from what the study often says. Um, and so one example is all of these news reports saying, this was a super spreader event. Um, there was this event and, and this many people, you know, were were linked to this event and were positive as a result. And one of the, the key ones I remember reading was about, well, one is about restaurants, but one is about schools. And when I actually read the peer review report, that's not what was happening at all. It was a big group of people, some of whom were going to school and some of whom were teachers or a big group of people, some of whom went to a restaurant, some of whom worked in a restaurant. And then later it was established that some of the big group of people also were positive for COVID. But the narrative is, it's like a crime scene, as if the infection can be identified to a place and a time, like DNA on a crime scene. But that's not how infection works, is it? Like, correlation is not causation, as I believe you said, just because a bunch of people, some of 
whom are positive, it doesn't mean that we can say they got infected at this place at this time by these other people, does it? Or am I misunderstanding? No, that's because you have it exactly right, Naomi. It's you cannot uh, uh, identify, at least with the methods that for, for that are in common practice, who passed it to whom. This is a respiratory virus that's that spreads. Like it's asking, how did where did you get your cold from? Right. I, right. I keep thinking about that. We used to say it's going around you yeah. know, back when we had sanity. <laughs> and the lack of moralization is really important here, right. right? It's not, we don't go around seeking somebody to blame. We just deal with the fact that we have a cold. And we take steps to, to reduce our risk. You know, we wash our hands. In this case, so social distance. I mean, if, if you're in a crowded place wearing a mask, I mean, these are like tools we can give people, but you don't turn it around and say, if you don't do this, you're an evil person. That is right. the, that's the mistake. Give people tools disconnected from this moralization. Right. And and I, I, I'm going to expand on that and say disconnected from coercion, right? I mean, in the world of public health, apart from the questions people like me ask, is it constitutional to coerce people? Is it, you know, what you do in a free society co to coerce people? Isn't isn't there also evidence that in public health, when you coerce people, you get worse outcomes than when you encourage, support, educate? Isn't yeah, that sort of what you were saying earlier? I agree. I mean, I completely agree. Like, I think, look, if if uh, if, if you tell people um, a good reason to do something, and it connects to them in where they live, um, and and it makes and it makes sense, they'll do it. Right. If you if you say you have to do this, or else you're will 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 we won't let you get you know live your life in any way. Mm -hmm. They'll try to find ways to avoid it. They just will. I mean, just and so the smart thing in public health is let's take into account how people actually are. Make persuasive arguments where that, uh, that are persuasive to the person you're talking mm -hmm. with. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about age now. I drill down into it a little bit more. I uh, was sent the breakdown of COVID infections, hospitalizations, and deaths in Massachusetts where I live. And it was a completely eye-opening document because broken out by age category, the average age of infections in Massachusetts was mid forties. The average age for hospitalizations was 74 and the average age for deaths was 80 or 81. So that is like, unbelievably interesting and important. And then I looked at other data that confirm it. Um, someone sent me the breakdown for Canada and I saw that there had been one death in this whole time. Every death is tragic, but one death of anyone under 19 um, in, in this, this whole time period in the whole country of Canada. Yet all the children and teenagers of Canada are, are locked indoors, you know, in my view, being traumatized psychologically. Um, but that's- I, No, me, I agree with that. Me kind of opining. Um, and so it's really sad if there's a disease that kills people whose average age is 80 or 81. But as I understand it, pneumonia and flu and other respiratory diseases also tend to kill people. If they kill people, they're going to be people of that age group. And so basically, the narrative of coronavirus is it's everywhere around us, it can destroy us, but really data seem to be confirming what I wasn't sure about when I first read the Great Barrington Declaration, that it is so age stratified that really younger people are not at risk when they gather, that really we should be supporting older people. Can you speak more about the age difference and what the world should look like in terms of age if we followed the Great Barrington recommendations? Yeah, so like, I, like, um... Let me tie it to, a, 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 I think, a huge mistake in public health messaging, right? So what you said is exactly right about the statistics you, ask, you give are, are good, give a good flavor of exactly the who's at risk and what the risks are, right? So, but people perceive it, no matter what their age, they perceive it as the same high risk. Mm -hmm. well, what does that mean? Right. That, that means that people who are younger, they are scared to death about something that is much less deadly to them than they, than they realize. And so they undertake actions that harm them as a consequence. They, they stop seeing their friends. They, they live in fear about, uh, you know, over, over basic things. Um, for older people, they, they end up taking more risky things, doing more risky things they are because they think the risk is less than it actually is because they have the public health mm -hmm. has conveyed to them really how sharp the age gradient wow. is. That's so um, interesting. So it's just a mistake. And so, and what you said is, so like just for instance, for young people, right? So uh, we closed our universities in March, April. Um, we sent home people 
who are like 19, 20, 21, 22, to live with their parents and grandparents, we created multi-generational homes. And, and these, this very strange tension that I'm sure so many of your listeners are familiar with where the 19 year old does normal 19 year old things, hanging out with friends, and then they come home and they be made to feel enormously guilty for having done it. Right. Well, it was the lockdown that caused that. The lockdown sent them to go back home living with their, with, to, to, to live in this place where there was this risk, uh, risk of spreading the disease to an older, uh, you know, the old, old, older person that's living in the same house. Um, we could have done something very different. We could have just let them be at university, uh, protect the older professors uh, from having to teach in person, let all younger professors teach in person. The disease would have gone around, that's true. Um, but that just, it, 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 you could have also, you, you would have told people to take protection, you know, to social distance, all that. I'm not, 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 nothing against that. But when they went home, many of them would have been immune already. Wow. So, uh, um, one of uh, someone of your um, who's identified with your kind of worldview said in passing that it was good for college students to socialize and be in groups and even cat, you know catch the virus because it would lead to immunity and it, it's healthy for them to do so. Is that crazy or do you agree with that? I mean, I, I don't think we should ever want anyone to catch the virus. That is not so. so we're not arguing for it. What I'm arguing is let people do their normal things. Like not doing the normal things hurts them. Right. If we just think about it as infection control, then we, we say, oh, they, they should, you should stop doing everything normal. But then we've ignored everything else in their life that's worth doing. Right. Um, so let me talk about immunity now, because the phrase herd immunity got widely mocked, especially when you guys first came out with the Great Barrington Declaration. Um, and I was surprised to learn that herd immunity is actually a, a phrase from public health that's 30 years old. Is it true? I mean, something that is puzzling me is that my eighth grade, you know, immunology class in bio in middle school taught me that when you get sick, you get immunities after you recover. So I'm very puzzled that it does seem like we're designed to develop immunities when we're exposed to pathogens as a group over time. Yes, some people won't survive, like that's the nature of a very serious disease, but isn't that bound to happen sooner or later? Isn't that what we're seeing with the fact that the data are coming in in Sweden and Florida didn't do much better or worse than states and countries that have locked down severely? It, speak to me about herd immunity. Yeah, so the so the, the the idea is it's even even older than that. I mean, it's a very simple idea, right? So, um, if two people interact with each other uh, randomly, and one person has the disease, will they spread it to the other person? Well, if the other person is already immune, that interaction won't result in the spreading of the disease. Which is a fact, right? So, and I suppose that most of the people you interact with already have had the disease. That person, even though they have the disease now, can interact with all these other people. And they're not going to spread the disease to anyone because all these people are immune. Right. That's, the, that's essentially the idea behind herd immunity. And that's so that's been kind of written about as if it's a gigantic experiment that's going to kill off millions of people, but it's a very well established principle in science, I mean, right? I mean, let me put it this way: the the um, uh, the end point of this, this disease, this epidemic, is herd immunity. No matter what you do, whether we have lockdowns. Uh, with or without the vaccine, no matter what we do, the end point is a situation where most of the people that you interact with won't are already immune in some way. Okay. Um, that's so this just pathogen is bound to be less fatal over time, apart from for those unfortunate people who have succumbed to it. Is that? Yeah. So I mean, I think the, that's the, that's why the idea of focus protection. You reduce, you minimize the harm from the disease if you protect the people we know to be most vulnerable. Got it. And, and the people that are that are otherwise exposed, I mean, you it, it's better in, in terms of like the total death and mortality sense if it's people that are, that actually face very low risk from the disease. Right? This, that's just normal sense, right? So that's it's nothing scary. It shouldn't scare anybody. It's it's just a fact. I mean, and all, there are lots of other diseases. Zika is a good example, a recent example of a disease that's controlled by herd immunity. Right. Uh, there's no vaccine for Zika. It, um, uh, there's another, there, there's basically um, many, many, many diseases are, are have. Now, there's also this like sense that people mistake what it means. It doesn't mean that the disease has gone to zero, mm -hmm. where it's gone forever. It stays in the population, it, uh, I, but it just doesn't grow. Like it hurt me, technically it means if one person with a disease meets another person, um, on average, they spread it 
to one additional person or fewer. Gotcha. Right. So uh, right. Uh, that if if I if I get it and I spread it to one more person, disease is not spreading, right? It's it's I'm only and it's probably declining. Um, Herd immunity is not eradication of the disease. I think there's there's a mistake about that. Right. Uh, in a sense, we have to learn to live with the disease. Right. I mean, it's just like we learn to live with 200 others. Right. So is it fair to say that that phrase herd immunity, which I've read being defined as these people are wanting to perform a eugenic experiment on the po population as a whole and endanger them. In fact, it's just a description of how immunity works. Is, is that accurate? Is that fair to say? Yeah, that's completely accurate. I mean, in some sense, like people have used this in a, in a, like basically ignorance of some people uh, about sci basic scientific processes and use this to try to, uh, to discredit a, ba a basic scientific fact. I mean, that's just a very odd thing. It's not eugenic. It's not. In fact, the the goal, the whole goal of policy should be to minimize mortality in some right. sense, right? Minimize harm. Right. So, okay. Well, let's talk about very briefly two other questions. You uh, of Stanford and Professor Martin Kuldorf of Harvard and Professor Sunetra Gupta of Oxford, very distinguished backgrounds. All of you, um, you've been. I mean, I'm just going to go there. You've been very vilified in some quarters. Uh, and people have said, and I've heard people who don't know you personally say, well, they're in it, you know, because of partisanship or they're, you know, presenting a right wing or a libertarian, you know, viewpoint, um, or they are, you know, covering for business interests that want to reopen and kill everybody. Let me just ask you, what led you, I'll just ask you to speak for yourself. I'll ask your colleagues another time if I get a chance, but you don't strike me as a satanic person, you know? <laughs> what led you to go through all of this? What was your motivation for making such a public declaration and 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 not backing away in the face of all of this um, reputational attack? I mean, it, it's um, looking at what we've done, I, I, I still think of this as the biggest public health mistake, these lockdowns as the biggest public health mistake we've ever made. And the harm to people is catastrophic. Poor people, people who can't, don't have a voice to speak up uh, and, and complain, they, they just don't. Um, and not just in, in, in rich countries, but I think in poor countries as well. Poor, every, I think every poor person on the face of the earth has been harmed by these lockdowns. Mm -hmm. I, I just feel an obligation to speak up for them. Um, I think, cause I think it's, it's one thing if this was the only possible policy Mm -hmm. Then, then that would then that I would have stayed silent, right? Um, but I think there's an alternate policy that will reduce the total amount of harm, both to the poor and to the more well off, if we follow it. That's that's what motivated me personally uh, to, to 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 speak up and continue to speak up. Um, I've also heard, I mean, th there's this element of like fear that people have had in in the run up to the uh, the, the Great Banting Declaration, even since. Um, that if you speak up, you will be you'll be canceled or, or, or hurt. I mean, I, and I just I don't I like to stand up to bullies, so it, <laughs> there's some element of that in, in it. I, I confess, um, uh, but I think uh, to, to, like really, if you're asking me like from a deep personal thing, where it's yeah. driving from, you read it in my bio. I I spent my career trying to understand how how policies can help or hurt vulnerable people. Why um, did you choose just as a human being? Why did you choose vulnerable populations to? To focus on so many people are able to you know dismiss them marginalize them forget about them anything from your own background that led you to care about that specifically making I mean, sure I, I, people have um, a voice i went to medical school because i want to i mean <laughs> this sounds corny i wrote i want to help people that's like you know that's that's what you write in your medical school application i really meant it um and uh I'm, i mean i, I have a i'm I'm, I'm a christian that i mean i have a that, that leads me to want to help the, I mean, there's a call to help the poor um uh that's part of uh, like the very call for my existence, I think. So I think I think there's some element of that at, at, at play. Um, and when I, in this policy, just it strikes me as the exact wrong thing for the poor, for the for the vulnerable. Well, the numbers are definitely coming in that the poor are harmed most. And even when I just go out in the world, it's working people who are saying, "I want to work and feed my family. I can't. I have nothing to feed my kids with." Um, and, and wealthy people, you know, who get to kind of telecommute 
and have a cup of cappuccino are less concerned about lockdowns. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Um, you, you've spoken about the silencing of scientists generally and you know, other reporting I've done has also been interviewing scientists who are being um, encouraged to keep quiet uh, about some of these COVID policies. Are you seeing silencing of other scientists as well? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, the, the, the vilification of scientists who disagree with the lockdown ideology has been, I mean, unprecedented in my life. I mean, just, I've never, very, very prominent scientists, friends of mine, brilliant scientists, like there's this uh, gentleman, Johnny Anides, who's, uh, I mean, if you go back and look, he's probably the most highly cited scientist in the world, actually, even more than most Nobel Prize winners. Um, and yet he, he, everything he, every time he writes anything, he gets this like cadre of people uh, very unfairly attacking him, maligning him, um, I, I, other scientists, young scientists have been writing to me telling me how difficult it is for them to, to say anything because they're scared that that will happen to them. Scientists are human too. Right. Um, and so it makes, you can understand, like if I say something where I'm just gonna get all kinds of things slung at me, mm -hmm. I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna step back and maybe I'll study something else or do, you know, be quiet. I, I think that, that that's happened a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and there's been explicit calls for censorship of science by other prominent scientists. Wow. Um, so it's, it's one of these things where like, I, it's, it's remarkable, like science can't function without a free interchange of ideas. It's a dialect, it's a process that where, you know, if you and I disagree, we, we agree on a experiment, whether the experiment says, if it comes your way, then you're right, I was wrong. And then we, then we disagree on the next thing. And that's what's how science works, right? That's, that's how it ought to work. Instead, it's this sense of like, if I say something that disagrees with the lockdown ideology, I'm saying something dangerous. Well, I, you know, it's, it's dangerous for us. Yeah. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. What were you going to say? Amy. Yeah, yeah. So, no, so you're right. Dangerous. For, I mean, I think it's, the problem is science in the context of a epidemic is, is a matter of life and death, no matter what. There's just no other way around it. Right. You have to conduct science the way it should be conducted, which involves disagreement and discussion and debate. And science decided during this epidemic to stop that. It's right. like we decided to stop doing science altogether. It's very, very strange. You're, you're identifying something that, you know, I'm not a scientist, but I benefit from the enlightenment. You know, every time scientists respectfully disagree and then, you know, do an experiment to see who's right, I benefit. And I'm really scared that we're going back to the dark ages or at least the pre-modern era where you're not allowed to question Galileo. You know, you're not allowed to. <laughs> it's a, it's a very you, strange thing. burnt at the stake. Sorry? Yeah, I mean, you're, I agree. It's a very strange thing, right? Like in some ways it's science performed well, like the vaccine coming up so quickly is that's a, that's a, that's a fantastic thing. It's really amazing actually that science performs so well. Um, but at the same time, this, the, the public health science, the science around all, all, the, the, what the right policy is. Right. Okay. We've decided only lockdowns, everything right. else has to, uh, has to support that. Well, it's, that is bizarre to watch as more and more data come in showing, for instance, that school children are not at risk and yet the schools are not reopening. And, yeah. and as more and more data come in showing that kids are, are self-harming and having mental health crises. Um, so thank you for, for that. Last question. Um, I feel like I'm seeing some shifting toward your position as time goes on at pretty high levels. Are you, do you feel like you guys have made any headway in our other leaders, influencers, heads of nations, policymakers starting to say, you know, people, younger people are not at risk. Let's open up for younger people and support voluntarily those who are at risk. Yeah, so like I, I just saw the CDC director today encourage the opening of schools, which is a really encouraging sign. I mean, I think that, uh, um, that I think we are seeing this thawing, even you know, Governor Newsom in my state, California, uh, lifted the lock, the, the, the very strict lockdown and moved back to this tier system, which has opened up things a little bit, not, not, not as much as I, I, I'd hope, but still moving in the right direction. I do think that we're seeing some shift in the narrative, which is, uh, I think, encouraging. Um, well, you've answered all of my questions. Is there any final um, recommendation you want to make for parents or students or young people watching? Is there something they should do in your view to, that would change their lives um, apart from the way they've been living? Well, I think for older people, get vaccinated. That is vital. Uh, and for if you're living in a state uh, that, that's not prioritizing older people enough, complain so that your, your, your grandparents get vaccinated first. We have to protect the vulnerable. 
and the most vulnerable are older populations. Um, for younger people, uh, I mean, I don't don't shame don't, don't, if, for parents. Don't shame your kids if they live normal if they do normal kid things. It, Should it's you not, encourage them to do normal kid things and normal youth and young? I think things? so. I like have sport, do sports. There's no risk or very little risk from outdoor sports. Push very hard for your kids' schools to open um, because they're safer at school. They, they they grow, they develop more at school than they would if they're doing it from home. Um, so I think for 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 parents push very hard for your schools because because that's that you that's that's what's best for your kids and for everyone else's kids and for kids be be kids i mean don't be scared of your friends um they're not going to they're, they're, they're the covid is much less dangerous than not having friends i think those are very moving words to end on. That's Dr. Jay Bhattacharya of Stanford University. Um, I, I look forward to you know watching um, this unfold because you may well be standing at the right side of history. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Bhattacharya. Thank you, Naomi. A real pleasure.